Hello and welcome to theCUBE's International Women's Showcase featuring International Women's Day. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE here in Palo Alto, California. We've got a great remote guest. She's amazing, Kate Goodall, founder and CEO of Halcyon. Uh, CUBE alumni, great to see you, Kate. Thanks for coming on. Um, good, good to see you. You as well, always a pleasure, John. You know, International Women's Day is a big celebration. We're doing a lot of interviews with great people, making things happen, moving and shaking things. Um, but every day is International Women's Day as far as we're concerned. It's happening all around the world. But these are stories of innovation. These are stories of, of change. These are stories of transformation for the better. You've been doing a lot of things uh, and I want to get into that, but let's start with your background. Tell us a little bit about who you are and what you got going on. Um, yeah, my background is, is a little strange. I used to be a maritime archeologist, so um, dove on shipwrecks for a little bit. That was amazing. Um, I always jest, and it's only partial jest um, because it's actually a bit of truth to it, that uh, learning how to you know, handle things at depth really does train you to be a CEO because you learn to control your breath and, and focus on the things that matter and not be so reactive because it's the reactivity that will, and the panic that will kill you. Um, uh, so always knowing how to reframe, return to the basics. Um, those are really good things to hold on to even in the world of business, right? So um, I, I, at some point ended up um, uh, doing, doing a lot of things, largely business development, following my time diving and uh, met an amazing woman, um, another woman for International Women's Day uh, named Dr. Sachiko Kuno, who was a biotech entrepreneur from Japan, uh, stepping down as her role um, at the helm of her uh, company. Um, and she wanted to launch uh, a space for young innovators from around the world who were doing amazing work to tackle these very complex challenges we all know exist. Um, uh, and figure out a way to give them time and space to do their best work and um, and pursue their, their highest visions for change. Um, we decided that we would focus on for-profit companies largely um, who were uh, using sustainable, scalable business models um, to pursue both profit and purpose, um, creating a virtuous cycle between the return of money to a company and, and pouring that into to go even further and faster towards um, solving a problem. Um, so we now have companies, over 200 companies from around the world that we've helped support uh, tackling every single sustainable development goal. Um, and I'm proud to say, you know, particularly uh, uh, related to this subject, that 59% of our companies have a woman founder or co-founder um, and 69% have a founder of color. Um, so we're working with entrepreneurs from every every area of the world, uh, many proximate to the problem that they are trying to solve, so they intimately understand it, um, and they're they're doing amazing things. Yeah, you got help. A great mission. You have a lot of other things going on. You're helping women, encouraging them, and to forge a career in, in the tech sector. Um, good statistics could be better, right? I mean, always higher and better. So, um, what are you guys doing? What are you specifically to help and encourage women? to forge their career in, in tech? Yeah, I mean, look, the good news is I do think that it's getting better. Um, I, I particularly think that uh, we will see that venture is improving. Um, it takes a while because the companies that had been funded up until now are still raking in the biggest amounts in their latest stages. So I think that percentage hasn't been shifting, but I, I have to believe that that's a bit of an illusion. And in a couple of years, we're going to start to see it level out. But you know, as well as I do, that they're pretty paltry statistics in terms of the amount of venture that women led companies capture. Um, and the other ways that women are, are doubted um, in terms of their, um, ability and potential. Um, so we we love to work with any underrepresented uh, group of entrepreneurs and there's ways that we do that, um, whether it's helping them sort of find their power and hold space and be confident and, um, you know, uh, be able to pitch to, to any room, talk to any investor, talk to any customer, um, but also working to um, be directive about some of the systemic challenges, both in terms of talking to existing investors and trying to educate them to see the opportunities that they're missing because there is um, an economic imperative to them understanding what they're missing. Um, but there's also some uh, uh, things that we're doing in house to make sure that we're also helping to close capital gaps um, for all our entrepreneurs. So uh, we actually now have a suite of three capital mechanisms um, that our entrepreneurs can access on the back end of our incubator. Um, a microloan fund, which is um, 
uh, very quick turnaround, small amounts of capital um, for entrepreneurs who uh, exist in opportunity zones, which is a tax designation just based in the US. Um, but that's meant to be deployed so that they can um, access capital towards revenue um, without credit checks collateral um, being put up uh, and a slow moving pace of banks and CDFIs. It's particularly useful for people who may not raise venture and it's useful for um, uh, uh, you know people who maybe don't have that friends and family check that they can expect. Um, similarly, we've got a great angel network who look at the best impact deals from around the world. Um, and it doesn't have to be a housing company, just a great venture that's pursuing impact and profit. Um, and then lastly, uh, we're just about to announce that we have a um, fund of our own on the back end of our incubator that funds only housing companies. Um, it's an early stage fund. Um, but watch this space because our pipeline is just increasing year over year. Um, we used to serve just 16 companies a year. And now we're serving 60 this year. So um, yeah, it's really exciting. Um, and so obviously it's really great that, you know, uh, we're going to be able to um, help uh, scale the impact that we want to see uh, ideally a lot, a lot faster. Well, wow, you're definitely taking the command and control. I remember when we chatted just a few years ago, I think four years ago, you just think you was getting getting going and, and it was growing now with great tailwind. Um, yeah. And the diversity of, of sources of capital as well as diversity of firms is is, is increasing. That's helping. Uh, that's a trend we're seeing. But you're also got the back end fund for the Halcyon companies, but also you've been involved in We Capital for a long time. Uh, can you talk about that? Because that's a specific supporting women entrepreneurs initiative um, tell yeah. us about what's, what's up with We Capital and Share, please. There was, there was another um, uh, venture that I, I embarked on with Sachco, um, as well as Sheila Johnson um, and uh, Jenny Abramson, who runs uh, Rethink Impact. We Capital is a, a group of about 16 women that um, I pulled together, women investors, um, to invest uh, through Rethink Impact, which is another um, uh, fund that is looking for impact businesses, but predominantly looking for those businesses that are led by women. Um, so this investment group is women supporting women um, uh, through the use of and deployment of capital. Um, they're doing amazingly well. They've had um, yeah. some really stunning news um, recently that I'll let you dig up. <laughs> oh, I'll definitely, thanks for the lead there. I'm going to go jump on that story. Yeah. Uh, the, Not the, mine to share. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, um, okay, thanks for that lead. Uh, on that trend though, in Silicon Valley and certainly in other areas that are hotbeds like New York, Austin, and DC where you're at, um, you're seeing now multiple years in, almost a decade in of the pioneers of these women only funds or women only firms and or investment. Um, and it's starting to increase to under, all underrepresented minorities and entrepreneurs, right? So take us through how you see that because it's just getting more popular. Is that going to continue to accelerate in your mind? Uh, are there networks of networks? Are they cross pollinating? Yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's, I'm glad to see it. And, uh, you know, it's been a long time coming. I think, you know, I think we all look forward to a future where it's not necessary um, and, you know, funds just invest in everyone. Um, until then, making sure that we have specific pools of capital allocated to ensure that, that you know, those entrepreneurs who have not always been equally represented get to pursue their ideas, not just because they deserve to pursue their ideas, but because the world needs their ideas, right? And, and as I mentioned, there is a business imperative, right? We've got lots of examples of businesses like like banks that you know wouldn't have gotten a shot just because the investors just didn't understand the opportunity, um, um, and I think that's normal. That's human. It happens to everyone. You are successful as an investor largely because you recognize patterns, and if something is is you know outside of your life experience, you are not going to identify it. So it's very important that we create different pools of capital run by different types of people. Um, and, uh, and you know, I know lots of investors of every type that are investing in these funds because they recognize that, you know, perhaps the highest 
uh, growth potential is going to come out of these, um, you know, particular kinds of, of funds, um, which is really exciting. Yeah, and that's super important <laughs> because there's half the world is women and that's just like the population is inspired by many new ventures and that's super exciting trend. I want to ask you about your other area you're doing a lot of work in. The Cube has been to Bahrain multiple times, um, initially reporting on AD versus region out there and that certainly is an important part of the world. Um, you've got a lot of good news going on there. Can you share what's going on with Halcyon uh, and uh, the social entrepreneurship going on in Bahrain and around the region? Yeah, I'm happy to. We, um, we've actually been so privileged to work with AWS for a very long time. Almost since the start of the incubator, they've supported our entrepreneurs, all of our entrepreneurs with um, uh, access to cloud credits and and services. Um, and we've sort of doubled down with AWS in the last couple of years uh, in areas where we both, um, you know, want to, to create an uplift um, for, you know, small businesses and, and rapidly growing um, tech solutions to these, these social environmental problems we see. So they've been an excellent partner to do that. And um, one of the areas we dipped our toe in the water was, was with Bahrain, uh, particularly with uh, women tech startups, women-led tech startups in Bahrain. Um, uh, we did that last year. We had an amazing group of women over in DC um, and we continue to support them. One of them is actually in the process of um, uh, raising, I think she just closed her seed round recently and that's Wafa um, Al Al Alubadat. Um, and uh, she created Playbook, which is an amazing, um, uh, tech-driven platform for women to take masterclasses and network and um, really sort of level up, um, as as um, Wafa says. Um, but also um, the Mall of Work, um, uh, uh, Ijamia, just really talented um, women over in Bahrain, um, pushing the envelope in all, all sorts of directions. And it was wonderful to get the opportunity to work with them. Um, that has now spawned um, uh, another uh, set of programs serving entrepreneurs in the Middle East and North Africa that we're also working on with AWS as well as the US State Department. Um, so we're going to be working uh, for the next two years with entrepreneurs to help spur recovery from COVID um, in, in MENA. Um, and then I'm also proud to say that we're working with AWS uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa because there is just an extraordinary um, energy, uh, you know, in the continent, um, and some amazing entrepreneurial minds um, working on, uh, you know, the, the many problems and and um, opportunities that that they're facing and, and recognizing. Um, so we're supporting, uh, you know, companies that are working on finding. Um, skilled refugees to to be able to help them resettle and 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 use their talents and make money um sadly a very relevant um company now with what's going on in ukraine um uh but also uh you know uh a zambian satellite company um companies that are preventing food rate food waste by providing um solar powered um, refrigerators to rural areas in sub-saharan africa um, um, so a lot of, um, you know, just incredible uh, talent and um, ideas that we're seeing globally um, uh, and happy to be doubling down on that um, with the help of AWS. That's awesome. Kate, you do amazing work and I remember uh, following the work uh, when we met in DC. And again, you always had this international view um, it's International Women's Day. It's not North America Women's Day. <laughs> it's International Women's Day. Can you share your thoughts on how that landscape is changing outside the US, for example, and around the world on how the international piece is important? And you mentioned pattern matching. Um, you know, also when you see patterns, they become trends. What trends do you see forming that have been, that, you're, that are locked in on, that you see they're locked in on, that are happening, that are driving? What are some of those trends that you see on the international side? That, that that's evolving. Yeah, you know, I think the the wonderful um, opportunity with uh, the internet and social media is that um, you know both uh, we 
we can be more transparent about areas for improvement and put a little pressure where maybe things aren't moving fast enough. We've all seen the power of that. Um, the the other um, you know thing is that certainly in countries where women maybe aren't as free to move and operate, they can still um, acquire skills, education. They can set up companies. They can do so so much. Um, you know through these these amazing technologies that we now have at our disposal that are growing at amazing rates. Um, they can connect via Zoom, right? It's, uh, I think that while the pandemic definitely set women back, and we should acknowledge that, um, uh, the, the, the things that the pandemic perhaps um, helped us to exponentially scale will move women forward. And perhaps that's the, the nugget to, to hang on to, to feel optimistic about where we're headed. Yeah, and also there's a lot of problems to solve. And I think one of the things we're seeing, you mentioned the Ukraine situation, you're seeing the geopolitical landscape changing radically with technology driving a lot of value. So with problems comes opportunities. Um, innovation plays a big role. Can you share some of the successful stories that you're inspired by that you've seen um, in, in the past couple of years? And as you look forward, what are, what are some of those innovation stories look like and what are you inspired by? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's so, so many, um, you know, we just uh, uh, um, had a couple of, of entrepreneurs in just the last year, um, you know, after I think everyone sort of took an initial breath with the pandemic, they realized that, you know, they either had an opportunity or they had a problem to solve, to your point, um, and they either did that well or not, um, and, uh, or some of them, you know, uh, just you know, didn't, didn't have any more cards to play and had to really pivot. Um, it was really interesting to see how everyone handled handled that particular moment in time. Um, one company that I think of is Oxyware, um, uh, and she had created um, a wearable device that you can just put on your ear. It looks like a, an earring right at the top of your ear. Um, um, and it was for her, for herself, because she um, suffered from pulmonary complications and uh, it, without a more discreet wearable, you know, had to wear a huge device and lug around an oxygen tank and, you know, just to sort of have a good quality of life. Um, it turns out, obviously, during COVID, that that is a very useful item, um, not just for, you know, patients suffering from COVID and wanting to know what their oxygen levels were doing, but also potentially in athletics. So um, she's really been able to double down um, as a result of the, the trends from the pandemic. Um, and I'm really proud of proud of her and that's Oxyware. Um, another great one that we just, um, just came through our, our uh, last cohort, cohort 15, um, is Maya. Um, and she had a brick and mortar store um, uh, called Cherry Blossom Intimates, where she helped women have um, an enjoyable experience finding uh, and fitting bras post mastectomy um, to include sort of, you know, the necessary um, uh, prosthetics and things like that. Um, she, she even made it so that you could go with your friend who hadn't had a mastectomy and she could also find some, some lovely lingerie. Um, but the pandemic meant that that experience was sort of off the table. Um, and what that did was she decided to, to make it a technological one. So now she's, she's essentially Warby Parkered it. You can, you know, go to Maya, uh, online and you can, um, you know, order, uh, uh, measure yourself, work with a specialist all online, get a few different options, figure out the one that's perfect for you and send the rest, the rest back. Um, and I don't, I think without the pandemic, that would not have happened. Um, so she's now able to serve exponentially more, um, you know, women who, you know, deserve to feel like themselves post mastectomy. That's awesome. Kate, you're a great role model and you're inspirational. Um, I have to ask you for the young women out there watching, what advice would you share with them as they navigate into an, uh, a world that's changing and evolving and getting better with other women mentors and entrepreneurs and or just an ecosystem of community? Um, what advice would you give them as they step into the world and, and have to engage and experience life? Yeah, gosh, um, part of me always wants to resist that and say, don't listen to anyone's advice, you know, follow, <laughs> follow your heart, follow your gut, or at least be careful who you listen to, right? Because a lot of people will want to give you advice, I would say. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good advice. Don't take in my advice. Well, you've been a great leader. Uh, love the work you're doing at Halcyon, obviously in DC, but all around the world. 
Uh, and again, there's so much change going on with innovation. I mean, just the advances in technology across the board from with machine learning and AI, from linguistics and understanding. And I think we're going to be a bigger community. Your thoughts on as you see community organically becoming a big part of how people are engaging. What's your What's your view as you look out across the landscape? Community is becoming a big part. We're a part of tribes. What's your yep. uh, vision on how the role of communities play? Yeah, no, we we actually do think a lot about community at Halcyon. We we say that our our you know um, alchemy really is providing space you know, physical and mental space to, to think, um, access, access to capital, access to networks um, and community. Um, and the community piece is very, very important. Um, uh, our entrepreneurs leave us, like the number one thing that they miss is being among like-minded, um, you know, slightly slightly crazy, audacious people. Um, and uh, and I often joke that we're building a kind army, right? Because it is, you know, it's people who want to do it differently. It's people who want to do it with integrity. It's people who are in it for, for very different motivations than just money. Um, and, you know, you start to feel the power of, of that group together in its entirety and what that might look like um, as, a, as a community solving these global problems. Um, and, it, and it really is inspiring. Um, I do think that people are starving for face time and people time, hu real human time after the pandemic. I think Zoom won't go away. It's a great tool, um, but, uh, but we all want a little bit of that. And I will mention uh, just along those lines, John, if you don't mind a quick plug for an event that we're having uh, March 16th, um, um, also in partnership with AWS called Build Her, um, relevant to International Women's Day as well. People can um, either, if they're in DC, they can come in person, but we'll also have a virtual program um, and we'll be listening to some of the, the most inspiring uh, women leaders and entrepreneurs, both in uh, government and also the private sector, um, share their, their knowledge um, on this side of the pandemic for, for um, you know, the next tribe or troop of, of women entrepreneurs and leaders. That's great. We'll make sure we put that on our, on our website for sure. Thank you. Um, Thank you, appreciate that. it. And uh, we love the fact that you're in our community as well. Uh, you're doing great work, Kate. Thanks for spending the time with theCUBE and on International Women's Day celebration. Thanks for coming on and sharing. Thank you, episode. John. Okay. This is theCUBE International Showcase uh, Women's Day featuring some great guests all around the world, not just in the US, but all over the world. I'm John Furrier, your host. Thanks for watching.